Are employers required to pay employees who cannot get to work due to protest action? This is Stuff Employers Should Know. Welcome to Stuff Employers Should Know, proudly brought to you by LabourNet, management's ultimate HR solution. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Barry Gordon-Davis, and across from me is Yasser Yaslak at Ismail, which means that I'm back in the studio. Yay! You're always coming in and out, aren't you, Barry? <laughs> We've been quite busy at the moment. Um, so, yes, did you have any problems getting into the studio today? I didn't, although I believe there are other people or employees who are having such yes, issues. Yes, and that's, and that's what's quite unfortunate. We've been seeing what's happening in the media and uh, employees, residents and the like in the Tembisa region seem to be in a bit of a, a, a lockdown at the moment and are unable due to protest actions and, and a genuinely you know, dangerous environment at the moment. And uh, as a result, there is a lot of um, employees that are unable to go and fulfill their contractual obligations, um, or put it this way, uh, safely do so. Uh, there's an the absence of, let's say, transport, buses, taxis aren't going through there. We've seen that they've been burning cars and you know the public unrest has really been causing unsafe um, conditions for for those that want to you know residents and employees alike on being able to get to work and um, that then obviously leads us to today's question which is you know what happens with these employees that are unable to get to work uh, how does an employer deal with these situations when there is a genuine um, reason for them not availing themselves for work so obviously Barry like you've mentioned they can't get to work for a valid reason it's yes. unsafe for them to get there but from an employer perspective, what do we do with those employees? I mean, do we still have to pay them even though they're not there to fulfill their contractual obligation? 100%. And that's the, 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 the stalemate that we actually sit in is the employee says, I wanted to, but for the fact that it would have endangered my life and there was genuine lockdown situations. And I, I use the word lockdown loosely because we know that we've come out of a traumatic lockdown period, so I'm not assimilating it to that. But effectively, there, we've been getting reports of, obviously, taxis not running on their normal routes, buses not running on their normal routes, public transport in all ways and forms. Uh, there's also intimidation in uh, and, and residents inter being intimidated to stay at home or to participate in these protests and the like. Um, so we could say that there's a there's a valid reason. So they're saying that you know I, I wanted to, but I couldn't. Um, but then the employer, on the other hand, says, "Well, why must I fit that bill? Why must I then uh, effectively pay you?" So if the, the the contractual relationship would be one of no work, no pay, um, as a result of them being unable to to avail themselves for work, but. You know, it shouldn't be that hard line. And I think what we need to express in today's session is, um, you know, how, recommending what would be appropriate things for employers to consider under these circumstances. So, of course, we wouldn't be looking at any form of disciplinary action because our employee could not make it to work. So one thing that the employee should be, um, call it safe from, is mm -hmm. the employer taking disciplinary action for their absence because on face value of it, there is a valid reason why they could not. So if employers charge employees for um, unauthorized absence for failing to arrive on the day, they would have to then go and show that this person um, was genuinely misconducting themselves and it wasn't actually as a result of the well-known and common cause, um, you know, up unrest that is happening in the Tembisa region at the moment. I suppose if somebody is coming from another area and claims that they were unable to get to work, that could be investigated. But we shouldn't uh, be taking disciplinary action for employees who genuinely were unable to get to work as a result of what we've seen in the media at the moment. So, of course, employees shouldn't take it lightly either. I mean, there should be some sort of investigation to ensure that the reason is valid for the employees not arriving. And, and, and that's where employers should also get involved with their employees in terms of let's explore alternatives. Uh, if you cannot get to work, we've been getting reports of employers that are offering alternative transport. You know, if employees are reliant on public transport and that's the only thing that's stopping them from getting to the office. Um, employers providing work transport, um, uh, whether it's going and physically picking them up, but we need to obviously be mindful that that shouldn't be done in a way that's going to possibly endanger the lift or the, the person who's providing that service. But where there are 
um, employees that are si- simply left stranded as a result of the public transport issues um, and there is able to make uh, alternative arrangements with transports, that would be something that, that the employer can do to, to then obviously get them in and we would obviously be mindful of that it might not necessarily be dead on time. Uh, we can see where employees have made reasonable attempts to then get to work um, where it shows that the employee is not necessarily just sitting on their hands and saying, oh, well, you know, I watched the news today, can't get into work. There's a genuine impediment to them being able to get into work. But the employer can then also go and have a look at, um, you know, and and we've been exercising this for the last two, three years now. Uh, can they work from home? Is there another way that we can just temporarily adapt their work so that we can then get the benefit? But when we talk about... Um, and I think the main question really is, is what about those in- employees that genuinely have to be on site to work? And if they're not at the office or at the factory or at the workplace, they are unable to work. What do we do with them? So not like you when you need to record a podcast episode from home, right? <laughs> not like me. I just I just sit in my closet and try and find the best acoustics and do it. No, there's genuinely employees that would be left stranded and uh, with genuine reasons. Um, and they would obviously say, well, again, and that's where we get to that stalemate, I genuinely couldn't get to work. And the employer would say, well, I, you know, the nature of the employment relationship is, is that I could have provided you with work, but you weren't keeping up your end of the bargain. So um, with valid reasons, no disciplinary action. However, there can be options that the employer, um, an employer might uh, uh, go and say, well, we will then allow you paid time off um, over and above your allotted entitlement in terms of leave which is probably the the most generous uh, gen- uh, generous from an employer um, and it would be over the above but you know it could always bring bring to question employees that are in other areas um, saying well you know now a person's got an additional paid time off rather than myself and yes I wasn't subjected to to the same scenario but if a employer decides they can then take it off of an annual leave balance we've done many podcasts on on um the the fact that annual leave provisions and entitlements of employees are at the discretion of the employer so if the employer says you know what rather be safe stay at home and if you want to be paid and have paid time off to do so the employer can then choose to then obviously um, take it off of their leave balance but then again reasonable accommodation i'm not going to now send you home, deduct off your leave balance so that I can still pay you for while you've been at home, but then prejudice you, let's say, for example, at the end of the year when there's an annual shutdown and now force you to take unpaid leave because you haven't got the allotted um, accrued leave for that time. Then you would have to have a look at reasonable accommodation of trying to allow them to go into negative balances and the like. We need to also remember that this is very different to the podcast that we did with regards to ESCOM. Uh, providing us with that fabulous load shedding. That touch we, wood? Are you just well, saying ESCOM? No, I, I don't even need to touch wood when it comes to that because um, ESCOM on my way to studio have already announced that they're going to reinstate it for 4 o'clock. Um, so hopefully by the time that this goes out, which would be the Monday, I'm hoping that by then they've got their generating capacity back up and their maintenance of, of breakdowns is sorted and the like. But anyway, um, we did that podcast with the regards to what happens if the employees are at work and then we um you know there is a you know blackout or um actual load shedding and the the rules with regards to that now this is obviously very different where they under certain circumstances the employer would have to then pay for a certain portion of the day um a minimum of three hours depending on 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 the like in this situation they're not getting to work in the first place which means that that no work no pay principle would then arrive so basically in this situation reasonability wins the day Yes, and there's a genuine reason for this. So employers should um, take the personal circumstances of the employees into account and attempt to accommodate them, but it has to be a, you can call it a balance, a balance of these things. So in summary, you say that the no work, no pay principle does apply. First prize is to try and accommodate or adapt the working uh, conditions in any way or form, just temporarily, i.e. working at home or providing transport or the like. But in the absence of being able to do that, then come into an arrangement of either a um, uh, taking annual leave in order to be remunerated or a working back structure, i.e. where I'll still pay you for that time, but then you owe me that time and you can work it back in later shifts and the like. Um, That would be 
the best case scenario in these situations. And that's Employment Relationship Advice 101 with Barry Gordon Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yes. But so if you want to get in touch, uh, suggest topics, or even just to say a hi, uh, you can fire off an email to sesk at labornet.com or find us on all major social media platforms. So don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on any platform that you use to listen to us just to ensure that you never miss an episode and ensure that you stay in the know of all things labor law. So from myself, BGD, and Yas in the studio, till the next episode, cheers. Stuff Employers Should Know was proudly brought to you by LaborNet, management's ultimate HR solution. For more episodes from Stuff Employers Should Know, go to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you play your favorite shows. Case law or statutes referenced in the podcast are current at the time of recording.